So, in this what I suggest is I am going to show you a paper that I recommend that you read especially if you are interested in researching this area. So, uh, this was published in 2007 in the journal of structural multidisciplinary optimization. It was uh, published by uh, Tushar Goyal, Rafael Hafka and a couple of other people. Hafka is a kind of a guru of uh, surrogates okay? and I guess uh, Abdul Samad also has worked with Hafka and um, okay? so you can just it is very simple ensemble of surrogates. You can see it has received lot of citations also some, some thousand citations it has received. So, what they are talking about is uh, they will build a, a weighted average surrogate. Okay? This W i is the weight for the surrogate that you are talking about. This is again a linear sum if you look at it. <laughs> okay, too many linear sums. And uh, there are different uh, schemes that they talk about in terms of uh, the weights. They just generally say E and then at a later point this error they say it is better that you use a presser. Okay, but you can use any error that is what that is why they generalize this as E j, but uh, later later in the paper they recommend using the press error for doing that. Okay? And then they say that you use the best press that is one model and the other one is the, uh, uh, the weighted average the W T A 3 is the weighted average that they say. They say use it this way E i plus alpha E average times beta. Uh, the idea is you need to tune your alpha and beta accordingly which was uh, done in a subsequent paper by another author called uh, Erdam Ajar, but here they are taking some uh, beta to be less than 0 and alpha is less than 1. Uh, yeah, they are taking some specific values of alpha and beta to study. Just to give you an idea, for instance what they did is they took some function called the camelback function, uh, not the camelback, the Braninu function and what they are doing is they are running these uh, polynomial response Kriging radial basis 1000 times and they checked which model worked the best. Okay. This is the error, I mean this is the or weight metric. So, the weights will be given by one of these schemes and what they figured out is there was no meta model that was a runaway winner. You understand what I am saying? There is some numbers I have captured. PRS had the highest weight most of the time. 880 times out of 1000, who knows? The one sample that you took could have been that 885th where PRS was not the best fit. This is why that random simulations are important because it is based on DOE which is again random. So, out of the 1000 DOEs they did 880 times PRS was better and then Kriging came only 61 times, uh, sorry 59 times while uh, RBA, RBF took 61 times. This is for a known function. Okay. You cannot generate meaning like now today I do, I might get 80 and I might get only 5 times RBAF came and then uh, six, uh, the remaining times uh, Kriging was better. Because the 1000 DOEs that they created and I created could be different. And uh, this was in Latin hypercube. Let us say that you do Hammersley sequence, you might entirely get a different stuff even these numbers will not be. So, this is a simple x1, x2, two dimension problem that we are talking about. Okay. So, this the whole idea is they say that you know no single meta model is going to unless let us say that I know this function and I have built this approximation over the years which is what you have what they call subject matter experts in uh, companies when you go automobile companies, aerospace companies they have subject matter experts they have very good understanding. Okay. In those cases you know what is the function to be fitted and you can use it, but that is not the case here. Okay. So, then they also give uh, some 6 different uh, test problems, Branino, Camelback, Hartman functions and then it is interestingly what they do is, is they also show you the variation of the functions themselves. They evaluate the function at these 1000, the 1000 DOEs for each of them. And then they show you how the Branino function varies. It can vary anywhere, the value can vary anywhere between 0 to 300. Okay. So, and then they just show for the different functions. Okay. Without any normalization, they are trying to run this stuff. And then they are discussing about the prediction metrics. As I pointed out, they will use correlation coefficient between the input and the output, oh, sorry, between the actual and the predicted. 
they do an RMS error, RMSC, we discuss that and uh, the maximum error, okay, interesting, where are they using the, the okay, the press is, uh, okay, the press is discussed, this is only for the, the metrics that they use, okay. So, okay, this would have been good if it is color, but it is okay. okay. So, what they are doing is, the way they are plotting this one is, they are taking A is maximum, yeah. They are looking for maximum errors, standard deviation of errors in the prediction. So, they start with about uh, 12 samples, I guess, 20 samples, 21 by 21 uh, grid is what their test metric is. They use about 12 samples for uh, fitting. With the 12 samples for fitting, they do 1000 times, they repeat this procedure and then they say that this is a standard deviation of the responses with respect to the actual errors, okay. If you look at it, the maximum standard deviation and then you can see that, you know, Krigging performed slightly better than the other two guys in terms of the errors. But then you see there are a lot of outliers in Krigging compared to PRS and radial basis. Similarly, whereas in this guy, where whichever regions the error was minimal, you can see that each of them, all of them performed very, very similar. There is no variation. That is what is captured. There is no variation between these performance. That is why this error is the least, okay. Whereas in this, there was error maximum deviation in the function evaluations and then each one predicted something else, okay. So, this is what I meant. Whenever there is maximum variation in the predictions, it means that there is uncertainty in the design space itself. So, you need more samples to understand what happens there. Whereas in this case, it so happened, okay, but please understand that this being more or less the same does not mean that your prediction is good. You might totally be off also, okay, but this is guaranteed, okay. So, they test all these things, they give you the median plots and all that and they also give you the actual plots here, okay. Ah, so, this is a response correlation that they are plotting. You can see how it is varying for each one of them. See, I, I hope you understand a box plot. It is uh, 1000 repetitions, I am just plotting each one of that. The central line is a medial line. This is a 5th percentile, this is a 95th percentile and these are the outliers, okay. It gives you a distribution also, okay. So, you can, um, uh, this is an interesting paper if you are looking at ensembles and uh, they suggest that uh, you use a weighted average surrogate or you kind of use a weighted ensemble unless you have some information on what ensemble to be used, okay. So, this is one stuff. Uh, paper that I recommend that you use and just uh, discuss a small case study that we did. With that, I will wrap it up, okay. So, uh, we try to apply this idea to a biomedical problem, okay. So, one of the doctors that we work with in CMC Vellur wanted to understand for a specific type of uh, degenerative disease, uh, disease called the uh, osteoporotic bones. Okay, when you grow old, predominant in Indian males, there is a condition called osteoporotic bone, which is degenerative. Generally, your bones are supposed to be generative, but as you grow old, they will lose some density and they will become degenerative, okay. So, then what happens is uh, you have some issues, your body weight and your uh, the bones needs to realign accordingly and all that. In such cases, usually they put some and the bones also become weak, so they might break. So, under osteoporotic conditions, when you do a fusion kind of or a graft, you put something and then you plate it, you screw it. It was not clear whether the regular number of screws that are used on a healthy bone is good enough for an osteoporotic condition also. So, they wanted to understand what is the pullout strength, okay. Will this be good enough for it to hold it? And uh, as you see, we really need human bones to test this, but it is not possible. Okay, so, then we can source some cadaver bones, meaning bones from the dead body, but that is also very difficult, right? Like male, that particular age, osteoporotic condition, people should be willing to give the bones specifically for the spinal cord. So, it was a very expensiveness in that sense. You will have to wait infinitely 
you know you might not be able to get so you will finally after 3 years of wait we were able to get 6 cadaver bones to do the study okay that is all only 6 samples. So, that is the our high fidelity simulation then we use some low fidelity which is um, the FDA the federal drug agency suggests that some kind of a foam which is equivalent okay I do not have the foam thing here there is a foam okay which uh, by changing the porosity in the foam you can represent the bones. So, they say you can whatever bone related stuff you can do it in this it is an approved test. So, that is a large number of simulations that we can do. So, what we do is this we mix this information and we build a meta model. We wanted to give a pull out strength calculator to the uh, to the doctor. So, the doctor has some information to begin with which is his input space density insertion depth insertion angle reinsertion you can see what it means ok. So, this theta is the reinsertion uh, sorry the insertion angle and L is the insertion depth density is the bone density that we are talking about and reinsertion is what happens is they put the screw and then they understand that uh, this is not uh, it is not going to hold. So, they remove and then they put another screw in the same place which is slightly longer ok. But as you know if you have tried uh, nailing something and removing the nail and then put another nail or a screw in the same spot it is not going to have the same the hold power it is not going to have the first time you put you want to put it the right time. So, this information if it is reinsertion means there is no reinsertion 0 means 1 means there was 1 reinsertion ok. So, you can see there are different levels here this they took an orthogonal array to do this that is a design of experiment these are the different levels. So, we have done about 32 experiments with the foam or these are the different uh, input parameters here is a pull out strength ok. Interestingly this is an experiment it is not a computer experiment. So, for this experimental setup the first one when I repeat it 3 times I get 3 different values you understand. So, which also tells us the foam captures the bone nature I take 18 years old male bone very similar structure I use another person's bone it will give me 2 different pull out strength that is exactly what this has given ok. So, there should be variability which is what we have done and what we did is we use something called an SN ratio signal to noise ratio for identifying see if you see I do not know whether you are able to see there is a small dot here. You can see 236, 634 and 677 are the other ones other two tests whereas, this test gave 236 for this configuration. So, we know that this guy is an outlier, but then here we can visually do, but when you are giving it to the doctor to do they cannot go and do all these things. So, what we do is, is we create an SN ratio, SN ratio is signal which is the mean of these information divided by the standard deviation signal to noise ok. And uh, in this particular case you want the signal to noise to be uh, meaning your noise should be less then this overall uh, thing will be. Uh, so, if this noise is more you this ratio will be less. So, wherever you get this value to be less then they are all issue prone guys you can see that these are all ok yeah wherever there were less less than 10 let us say you put a number on 10 then. So, that is one way of filtering the data. Then what he did is he took all these pull out strengths and fitted a meta model this is what he has done. Finally, compared it with 6 cadaver bones predictions. So, here is the point ok press RMS errors with Kriging trial 1, trial 2, trial 3. So, 3 response surfaces ok. Similarly, polynomial response RBF and weighted average surrogate. So, you can look at the press error the weighted average uh, press error was far better than other guys because you want the minimum error 0 error means that is the best fit. So, you can see the weighted average had the least error compared to any individual surrogate. Weighted average is you weight and take an average or just take this output, this output, this output add meaning Kriging, PRS, RBF and then you average them ok. What this plot gives is we plot the variations with respect to the 
six cadaver bones that we tested. Okay, so this is for about six. What we do is we give the inputs and then we ask our pullout calculator to give out what the pullout strength is. So was gave a different, RBF gave different, PRS gave different, Kriging gave different. We compared it with the actual value from that cadaver, and then we take a ratio of that. So if it is one, then my prediction is very close to the actual value. So as you can see in this particular stuff, Kriging gave a lot of variation. Okay, PRS had the least variation compared to even the weighted average surrogate, but then it was way off from the ideal line. And uh, this guy was okay, but he does not have a uh, what you call symmetric distribution. This had the median very close to the uh, 1 and then it also had a symmetric distribution. So weighted average surrogate was successfully used in this case to give a pullout strength calculator and currently this is in use. Basically in a qualitative sense, the doctor uses this to understand what is a pullout strength and then they make uh, decisions on should they put two screws, three screws or should they use uh, what should be the depth of insertion. Accordingly, they will choose the pedicle screw to do that, okay. Because pedicle screws are like your shoe sizes, okay. There are different uh, two, three sizes are there. They want to decide a priori and unless required, you do not want to screw further. Always they can do a worst case. They can screw, you know, to the deepest, but you do not want to do that. You do not want to disturb the nature stuff. So, okay. So, with that, I guess I am going to wrap this up unless you have specific questions. If you have specific questions, I will take it now. You have any questions in general? Okay, fine. 